deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure
say speak And we say move You say watch What you can do You say trust And then you prove You're the God Hello and welcome to Capel St Mary Methodist Church. It's great to join again to worship God together. So let's begin with a verse from Psalm 113. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So let's praise him now by singing, Praise is Rising. As we sing this, let's really turn our focus to God and remember what he's done for us. Let's really ask him as we sing this to join us afresh in our lives today.
Our theme today is Jesus for Skeptics, and we welcome Jim Ross, who will be sharing God's Word with us. When I was preparing for the service this week, I really felt that today is a great opportunity for us to really remind ourselves of what we believe. This led me to research ways of stating our faith, and this also took me back to my baptism. I was dedicated as a child by my parents, and then received into membership of the Methodist Church and baptised at the age of 15. The service of confirmation and reception into membership includes two questions, and they're asked as an affirmation of faith. First one, do you turn away from evil and all that denies God? And do you turn to God, trusting in Jesus Christ and Lord and Saviour, and in the Holy Spirit as your helper and guide? The answer to both of these questions is, by the grace of God I do. Then everyone present in the room is asked to affirm their belief and trust in God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. So, if you feel able to join together with us today in the Apostles' Creed, please speak out the words as we watch this video. Speak them out boldly in your homes as a reaffirmation of what we believe. We welcome Carol Velicott, who is going to read our Bible passage for today, and this will be followed by Jim sharing God's word with us. The reading is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Hello. And welcome to week one of a new four-part series entitled The Man Who Won't Go Away, based on Luke's Gospel and referring to Jesus. Today, we will be looking at the first four verses in chapter one, and the title that I have been given is Jesus for Skeptics. According to Reverend Andrew, it's just pure coincidence that I have been given this particular topic, but I'm skeptical about that. Only kidding. Week two is Jesus against hypocrites. Week three is Jesus credentials. And week four is Jesus versus Satan. When I first saw the title, The Man Who Won't Go Away, I immediately thought back to a few years ago when Carol and I were in Rome on a short break. 
One evening, we were walking through the centre on our way to a restaurant when we were approached by a man selling red roses. He tried to convince me to buy a single rose for Carol. When I asked the price, he said that they were five euros each, to which I replied, not a chance. To cut a long story short, I kept walking and saying no, but he wouldn't go away. Eventually he gave up, but decided to give a rose to Carol anyway, at which point I paid the man his five euros. We had a good laugh, and Carol kept that rose for a long time, just to remind me of what a cheapskate I am. But obviously the title of the series is about Jesus, and I think I will leave it to Reverend Andrew, who's doing the final talk, to draw conclusions as to what it means. So, first let's look at the background to Luke's Gospel. Although the author is not specifically mentioned, all the evidence points to it being written by Luke the Doctor who accompanied Paul on some of his missionary journeys. The detailed way he describes illnesses and diseases fits in well with this. Luke is also credited with writing acts, detailing, detailing the development of the early church. He's clearly an educated man with a wide vocabulary and an observant eye and is very comfortable with both Greek and Jewish backgrounds, much of which he explains for the benefit of his Gentile readers. Luke wanted to strengthen the faith of Gentiles and to show that Jesus Christ is the saviour of every kind of person in the world. This gospel gives us the most comprehensive and detailed account of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus as seen by eyewitnesses. Luke's stories reflect his own particular interest in certain people like the sick, the poor, women and children, and social outcasts. The gospel is written at a time when the church realizes the importance of writing down the stories about Jesus, which are circulating by word of mouth, leading to many strange and distorted rumors flying about. Luke writes his account for Theophilus, about whom very little is known. He would appear to be a Roman official may be high-ranking, as evidenced by his title of most excellent. He would also seem to have some interest in Christianity. Luke's purpose in writing is clearly stated as, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. The message edition of the Bible puts it like this, I decided to write it all out for you, most honourable Theophilus, so you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt the reliability of what you were taught. Luke wants to give a connected and orderly narrative of the life of Christ as seen by eyewitnesses. This last word, eyewitnesses, is very important as Luke's gospel is carefully compiled from reliable first-hand sources. He wants to get at the truth of what happened during Jesus' lifetime. So, if we go back to the title of this talk, Jesus for Skeptics. If you look up the meaning of the word skeptic, you'll find something like a person inclined to question or doubt accepted opinions. John Ortberg, writing in his book, Faith and Doubt, says that a skeptic is also someone who suspends judgment and commitment because they don't want to be wrong. They don't want to get hurt. He tells a story of three people sentenced to be executed during the French Revolution. When the first one, a priest, approaches the guillotine, he's asked if he has any final words, to which he replies, I believe God is going to save me. He puts his head on the block, the blade comes down and stops two inches from his head. It's a miracle, cry the executioners, and lets him go. The second man, also a priest, steps forward and is asked if he has any final words, to which he also replies, I believe God will save me. He puts his head on the block, the blade drops, and again stops two inches from his neck. It's a miracle, cry the executioners, and let him go. The third man, a skeptic, and also a non-believer in God, steps up. When asked the question, do you have any last words, he replies, I don't believe God will save me. 
I think I see what the problem is. There's something jammed in the gear mechanism. Ortberg says skeptics would rather, even at their own expense, appear to be right rather than take the risk of trusting. So, if a skeptic is someone with questions and doubts, then I am a skeptic. I am skeptical of some televangelists or high profile religious leaders who seem to be more interested in power, position, and prosperity rather than unconditional universal love. I'm skeptical about people who claim never to have any doubts about their faith. I'm skeptical about much of the teaching I received in church growing up, teaching that focused on us and them, in or out, good and bad, right and wrong, do this, don't do that, etc., etc. I believe that it is okay, even healthy, to have doubts and questions. As Christians, we have this ongoing tension between faith and doubt, belief and unbelief. Often it's because we don't understand many things about God and what he is doing. We do not have final answers to the deep problems of life. We can't. Only God knows. But we are in good company as there are many examples in the Bible of those who stood before God in confusion, grief, anxiety or fear, and addressed their questions to him. People like Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Job, and others. Even the disciples, as recorded right at the end of Matthew, where it is stated, and some doubt it. I believe, and I doubt. I hope, and I fear. I pray and I waver, I ask and I worry, I believe, help my unbelief. After the death of Mother Teresa, it was, it was revealed from her writings that for almost 50 years, she had felt that God had left her. She wrote things like, where is my faith? She used phrases like emptiness and darkness. She said, I no longer pray. On the outside, she worked and smiled, but described her smile as a mask. But she kept working and serving in spite of her doubts and has become a great example to all of us. There are many things that can cause us to doubt, and one of these is the area of suffering. Watching a loved one die, seeing a child with terrible injuries, Natural disasters such as tsunamis, floods, earthquakes, and the devastation they cause to people's lives. How can a loving God allow these things to happen? Suffering can cause some people to doubt, even lose their faith. I was speaking with someone recently and we were discussing the sudden death of a man we both knew well. Somehow, the subject of faith and God came up and he told me that he was brought up to go to church and even sung in the choir. But when his young son died of a cruel illness, he turned away from it all, and now wants nothing to do with God or religion. But for others, it can have the opposite effect, and can make their faith even stronger. That was my own personal experience. Hard times are part of life, and we all go through them in one way or another but the most important thing is how we react to them. God never promises us an easy life, free from adversity, tough times, suffering, etc. But he has promised to be with us in the midst of it. So I have doubts. And as I get older, I seem to have more questions than answers. But I also have faith in a God who is loving and who accepts me as I am with all my faults and failings. There's a difference between doubting God and doubting my understanding of God, just as there's a difference between trusting God and trusting my understanding of God. I've just finished reading a book by Brian McLaren called Faith After Doubt, in which he says this, Jesus modelled a different kind of faith, one 
characterized by humility rather than arrogance, solidarity with the other rather than exclusion and antagonism, courage rather than fear, collaboration rather than competition, love rather than self-interest. If we showed that kind of faith, then those who are skeptical of the church and of those who profess to be Christians might have a different opinion instead of seeing the amount of pain and suffering that has been caused by the church in the areas of race, colour, sexuality or gender. If you saw the recent Panorama programme with George Alagaya on the subject of racism in the church, then you will know what I am talking about. So, where do all these rambling thoughts leave us? Well, I think that if you're a sceptic, whether Christian or not, it's okay to have doubts and questions. In fact, it's vital. Don't look at the church with all its faults and failings. After all, churches are made up of imperfect, fallible people like me. But look instead to Jesus and what he taught and modelled during his lifetime. Read Luke's Gospel of the life of Jesus with the assurance that this is an accurate and true account. This lockdown has shown that there are many people out there with an interest in spirituality or Christianity, as many more people have viewed online church services than those who previously attended in person. People who would not normally go to church have been attending online services. Jesus didn't say join our church or our denomination or our religion. He didn't say sign up to this set of beliefs or rules, which is usually the approach that we use to determine a person's level of faith. But he did say, and with this I close, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and also love your neighbour as yourself. Speaking directly to Christians, he also said this, this is how men will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Whatever the question, the answer is love. Thank you, Jim, for sharing with us. We are going to continue our worship by singing together a song that reminds us of that most important thing, love. Underneath all of our doubts, and fears, one thing remains. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant through the trial and the change One thing remains One thing remains Your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on Never fails, it never gives up. Never 
part of our intercessory prayers today, I want to share two videos with you from Tear Fund. As we watch and listen, please use this time to bring your thoughts and prayers to God. Since the beginning of time, mankind has prayed. In the heart of the Philippines, on African plains. See, some pray for freedom, whilst others pray for change. But most of all, it's a declaration that our God reigns. Some prayer has tradition, several times a day. Others a conversation or a mumbling in a hallway. A reference to scripture like treasure in jars of clay. Or complete and utter silence as we wait upon his name. See, some pray round a table, some pray on their knees. For others, it's less like a conversation and more like a plead. Sometimes it's reread, like the Apostles' Creed. For some, it's in our bed, just before we sleep. What if I told you that prayer changes everything? That our God can actually do anything? That his promises quite literally hold tighter than a wedding ring? So when we pray, know that no prayer could ever be a deficit. See, prayer isn't just something you do on your knees. Sometimes it doesn't require you to speak. It's the inner scream that believes Revelation 21 is not just a dream. Because we pray prayers that make the blind see. Watched as Alina no longer struggles to make ends meet. Prayers that move people into homes and off the street. A world where clean water isn't a treat but a reality. We won't stop praying. We've watched businesses that were dead thrive. Watch young people proclaim that Jesus is alive. Watch Burungi's old sewing machine bring new life, a world where a woman's identity is not just wife. We won't stop praying. We've watched lives at risk be completely reborn. Seeing communities reunite to a once labelled as torn. Because in 50 years we've seen millions of lives restored and yet we are called to do more. We won't stop. But most of all we can't stop because we were created in relationship to thrive, not just survive. And as our prayers go up, it's Jesus who provides, the one who gave the ultimate sacrifice, when on that day, death's access was denied. So for this next bit, we're calling on his bride. So if you're able, let's get down on our knees. It's about time that we try. So repeat after me, we're going to do this three times. We're calling an end to world poverty, and Father, we do this under your authority. Show me the injustice of the world until it bothers me because it's time to fight poverty properly. We are calling an end to world poverty. And Father, we do this under your authority. Show me the injustice of the world until it bothers me because it's time to fight poverty properly. We are calling an end to world poverty. And Father, we do this under your authority. Show me the injustice of the world until it bothers me because it's time to fight poverty properly. We won't stop. Lord, you are our refuge and strength. E ajuda-nos a não temer. As the earth is shaken. Tu não mirirá em Tu estás com nós, Senhor, todo poderoso. You are calling us to be still. Be still, not afraid. Nem passividade. That you will be exalted among the earth. Be still. Be creative. A être généreux. A ser amables. Believe and trust. That you are God. A estar quietos. Be mindful. A ser tu pueblo, tu amado. Lord, we bring our hopes to you. Our families. Our finances. Nossa saúde. Y en nuestra quietud. En nuestros hogares, en nuestros negocios, en nuestros hospitales. We pray for wars to cease. Oramos para que cesen las guerras, para que las armas se destruyan. 
protected and peace declared as we face this together. We pray for the people trapped in their homes. With those who do them harm. To help to be released and restored. We pray for communities unable to isolate. Obligé de cohabiter, craignant d'être infecté. Ayúdalas a estar seguras y sanas. Nusalli min ajli shifa el marda. Ivai nao, mukushunguru tuwa nukuchema kwa. Acompaña a las personas en medio de su ansiedad y aflicción. Help us to be still. As you are exalted among the nations, exalted in all the earth. Até mesmo nesse momento. Be with us. Be our fortress, Almighty God. Amen. Father, thank you that we can come to you in prayer. I ask that you bless all of our prayers today and that you will show us how to be your hands and feet in this world. How to spread your love to those that really need your touch. We bring before you people that have helped us in our lives and thank you for them. And we pray for all those known to us who support others. In this time of quiet, please show us someone who is in need of prayer today. Help us to be there for them at this time. Prompt us to action, Lord. Prompt us to do your will in these situations. Amen. We will now sing again two songs reminding us of that faith that we are so certain of and declaring it to others. First we sing, My hope is built on nothing less, followed by, Men of faith, rise up and sing. Thank you. 
As we finish our time together, we will close with a video reminding us of the good news that we need to share with our world. We are God's witnesses in this world, and as the song says, how can we be silent? There are people out there that need to hear the news, and we are the only ones that can tell them. Before we watch, a blessing. May the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes. The love of God be reflected in your hands. The wisdom of God be reflected in your words. And the knowledge of God flow from your heart. That all might see, and in seeing, believe. Amen. I hear the ancient song I feel the shaking of the ground All of creation joins as one Heaven's roaring with the sound If the rocks are gonna sing your praise It won't be in our silence Cause you took off your grave clothes and left them with my burdens So how can I stay quiet, singing hallelujah Singing hallelujah Singing hallelujah Singing Prophesy your kingdom come Consume our hearts from now and then With all the breath inside our lungs We're bringing glory to your name If the rocks are Oh, it won't be Oh, cause you took off your grave clothes And left them with my birth so how can I stay quiet? Between heaven and earth getting blurred As we dance, as we sing The lines between heaven and earth getting blurred As we dance, as we sing The lines between heaven and earth getting blurred As we dance, as we sing between heaven and earth getting blurred We keep on dancing We keep on singing and dancing And singing And I can hear heaven Joining with voices Singing Alleluia Singing Alleluia Singing Alleluia
mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant through the trial and the change One thing, real 